Hey everybody, welcome to another special edition of Cappy Hour here on the GCAP Recap. I'm GCAP, and yes, this is a very special episode. Um, anybody that's been following my channel or knows me in, in real life knows I'm a huge fan of my guest's uh, body of work, and uh, most of you probably know him that are watching from you know, Chains as Chainsaw from summer school, Dave Marshak from Ski School. Um, I know him for, I know him for, 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 for more roles than that. Dean Cameron, everybody. Dean, welcome to Cappy Hour. Thank you so much for joining. How you hello, doing? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Great, great. Hopefully that was a good intro. I know you've been in a lot of other stuff. So if there was any <laughs> other movies you wanted to shout out, I mean, we're going to go through your catalog, but there's, if there's a, anything else you wanted to shout there's out. There's a lot started, of movies. There's a lot of stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was joking. Um, I, I had the interview years, with, with yeah. Stuart, who you're good friends with in real life. And I, I took a look at both of your resumes and I was joking. I said, it's north to south. It's, you know, this, the, the length of California, the state of California. You've, been, <laughs> you've done so much. So I just I think that's really, really great. More than some, less than others. You know. <laughs> Showbiz. I just, you know, everybody's spoken to you for about summer school, ski school, ad nauseum. I feel like I, I know all the stories of it. I would like to touch on it. I'll probably ask you a couple maybe personal questions that I have about it. But um, just to kind of get started going down um, your, your resume, Dean, here's a big question I have for you. In 1986... Many people probably don't know about this movie. In 1986, there was an NBC TV movie, Prince of Bel Air, not to be confused with the Fresh Prince of Bel Air by NBC a handful of years later with one Will Smith. Right. This was much better. Right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, the uh, the lead actor Mark Harmon, the female lead Kirstie Alley, um, uh, Patrick Laberteau, uh is in it, and yeah. Dean Cameron. Yes. You my you my friend are you you were also in it as well. Yeah. So now all of a sudden we go handful of months later, summer school comes out lead actor, Mark Harmon, female lead Kirstie. <laughs> Weird, huh? Weirdest coincidence ever, or just same casting director. I, I don't know who else to ask. Uh, 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 Don Swayze, Patrick Swayze's brother was my sidekick in Prince of Bel Air. Fun fact. Uh, no, it was sort of uh, this. Uh, yeah. You know, you work with people you like, you want to, and you want to keep doing that. And what I heard is that when uh, summer school, when they're trying to find the cast for that, Harmon actually, Mark, we, we had the same agents, I think, at the same time. And he said to my agent, I want someone like a younger, younger Dean Cameron. And my agent said, why not just Dean Cameron? And so went and read and anyway, book the gig. But yeah, he and Kirstie Alley at the time, you know, it was it was great. So it, I'm not making any sense, and I'm not going to finish a sentence ever. <laughs> no, no, I, I totally get it. I just thought to myself, I'm like, wow, what a what a strange set of coincidences. It wasn't even like one actor, or two actors. It's like yeah. so close together. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it, it was on Tubi. So it was the first time I, I actually saw it, and I just my mind was blown. That some like you know, if I ever talk to Dean Cameron. I'm going to ask him about this. And now I have the opportunity, I guess, kind of moving on next was summer school, as you kind of you know, were alluded to with Mark Harmon. I, I had just come off of uh, the impossible job of, of playing Jeff Spicoli on television. And so people sort of knew in, in the, within the industry who that I was up and coming or something. And so I got to go up on a lot of cool films and, and summer school was one of them, the, the one I booked. So, yeah. So yeah, you were Jeff Spicoli on Fast Times on that that run. Um, I was able to check out some of those. Uh, WWOR, the same channel I used to watch. Uh, they came from outer space back then. Used to used to air that um, sometimes randomly after that. So I thought that was that was always kind of cool. I'm like, hey, here's Dean Cameron again. And then wow. I didn't know there, there was a Fast Time series. So yeah, it was much later in the '90s. Not many, uh, not many people did know that. So yeah, <laughs> fortunately or unfortunately. You worked with Mark Harmon twice. People always ask you about working with Carl Reiner and, and, and all that, but what's it like working with, um, with, with Mark Harmon? Well, when he wasn't on heroin, he was great. <laughs> um, actually, everyone says he's one of the nicest guys in, 
in the world and he truly is really just a nice down to earth great guy uh charming loyal good funny and th- one of my favorite stories about mark Harmon is you know he was a college football player and you know his dad was a big football guy and he was gonna go pro and all this and the scene when they were shooting that he shot with patrick when they were playing football so we're sitting in our chairs and mark had his his football in his hand and just the way he held it you could tell he'd spent thousands of hours with the football and it was like he was just doing this like sort of rolling it around in his hand with one hand and just this real fast facility with this ball and it was uh was fascinating to see and he was just he was just talking and, and playing with this football and it was astonishing how the relationship yeah. he had with the ball it was really cool that's cool yeah so it was just like it was like almost like second nature to him yeah. like like yeah. muscle memory just yeah. well i didn't know that i did not know we played football that's, that's very yeah, interesting play, play for ucla a, oh wow yeah, Bruins. nice i do know that you um uh, patrick Labrato, you you know you, you've worked with him later you guys you guys are friends in real life you guys writing partners mm-hmm. um i know that uh richard um horovitz I, I know you you i've seen you've done different podcasts and interviews with him together what about the rest of the cast do you still kind of keep in contact with them at all or i saw um i well gary riley and i did a couple of uh, has been autograph conventions and where i saw uh kelly joe minter and i've also seen uh shawnee there and Fabiana, uh, Courtney and I stayed in touch for a bit, uh, but, you know, then she became super famous and I don't know what happened. And um, that's about it. I, I, I sometimes uh, trade like inst- direct messages with Kirsty on, on the Twitter when I was on the Twitter. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, you know, just... Life goes on, you know, that was 40 years ago, 30 years ago, something like that. It's crazy. Yeah, I know. I feel like my, my mom took me to see that movie and I feel like it was yesterday and you know, I'm a grown man and uh, it, was, it was so, so long ago, but that's when I first saw you, Dean, and uh, that's, when, that's when I became a fan. So okay. like many people love the Chainsaw character, but the next one, and not many, I don't see many people really ask you about this, is Bad Dreams. Am I mm-hmm. correct? Is that the next film you did uh, after Summer School? Yes, it is. It is. Okay. Um, uh, personally, I really do enjoy this movie. Um, it's another one I saw in the theater back then as a kid. Oh, cool. I saw you right away. I recognized you were in it. I thought that was cool. As a horror movie, I thought it was great. I, f- I feel like back then, even now, people will dismiss it because they're like, well, it's a Nightmare on Elm Street part three yeah. ripoff. And I'm like, well, back then, what wasn't? I mean, everybody, <laughs> went, with the- <laughs> everybody went with the horror formula, Dean. Right. Um, <clears throat> And and I can see why. I mean, there's a killer who's you know maybe supernatural. Right. There's teens in a in a psych ward, and Jennifer Rubin, right from Nightmare on Elm Street three, right. is the the face of the Believe, movie. She's yeah. she's the the main heroine. I wanted to ask you any kind of experiences or anything with that movie because I re- I really do enjoy that. No one really really talks about it. It's the D Cameron horror movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> well, there was a, a there was a writer's strike coming up and. Uh, I, I, ha- I had this deal with Paramount after summer school and that wasn't going well. We weren't trying to find projects. And then Grant Heslov, who I'd done a series with in 84, he's now George Clooney's producing and directing partner. Uh, he said, oh, I went in this movie, this horror film, Bad Dreams, you, it was really cool. So I called my agent, got in on it and booked the gig that day. Um, but it was really fun and it, and it was a cool part. It was a really cool part and uh, really happy to do that. And that was neat. I, I just, I had a great time and, and um, it was a weird mean movie that was uh, a little overlooked, but I understand why. And the director, Andy Fleming has gone on to do great stuff. And Gail Ann Hurd, the producer produced some stuff that you might've heard of. So. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> It's one of those movies to, uh, where the theatrical cut, um, if you, you know, I watched a theatrical cut as, as I was telling you as I was younger, I liked it a lot. I haven't had it on VHS. Mm. When YouTube first became like a thing, someone had leaked the alternate ending 
or I don't know which one was, I don't know which one came first, theatrical or this one, but it was like 15 minutes long. Oh. Changes the entire movie that you just watched where Harris, the, the main villain is actually still alive. And he did do all this stuff and he's bringing his cult back together again. And he's trying to bring Jennifer Rubin into the fold. So nowadays when I champion this movie and tell people about it, I always tell them to go buy it and watch the Blu-ray, watch, watch both endings, but watch the alternate ending after you watch the theatrical one, because changes the whole dynamic of the film. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize there was another ending. That's cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's, there's a totally different ending. So the, you know, the theatrical one that, you know, the doctor is a quack. He's giving people right. the, that he's giving all of you guys, those, um, your characters, not you, right. <laughs> those, those drugs that's causing these group hallucinations, causing suicide. And you get a jump scare. Right. Harris, Harris is dead. Right. This movie is, yeah, Harris is still alive. He's been orchestrating all of this. He, like I say, he got the, the band back together again with his cult, bringing people in. He brings her home. She, uh, Jennifer Rubin's character acts like she's, you know, embracing it. She just uses that to turn wow. on. You know, yeah, totally changes the whole movie. Yeah. Huh. It's like a totally different movie. So I tell her, I'm like, man, I want someone to make a fan edit sometimes so I can show people that movie. Because every time I will show people the theatrical movie of uh, the theatrical aversion, they'll say, that's cool. Are oh, you going to show me an alternate ending? Like, right. what did they change the camera angles? And I'm like, no, 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 just bear with me. Watch it. You'll see this, this whole new ending. And the first time I saw it, I'm like, wow, well, I like the movie a lot. Now I, with this new ending, right? I like it big time. I, I didn't know if you were aware of it. That's why I brought well, it up. Actually, I do remember. Uh, yeah. They, I remember that they did some reshoots and there was a whole bunch of stuff on the roof and that's how it ends. The theatrical movie ends, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he catches her on the roof or something. Yeah, that was a reshoot. So I guess the alternate ending that you saw was the original, probably the original ending. Okay, so where him being alive is actually the the original, and yeah. the theatrical is the yeah. Alternate. And you know, and I I do remember there was some I st shot some stuff where I was in in the cult house, and my throat gets slit. Mm -hmm. Um. Is that in? Is that in? Because it was. It wasn't in the version I saw. So I. I don't know. No, no. I um. I do know what you're. And I was going to ask you about this. This is my next. This is my next question. I was going to ask you about this. You. I don't know if you mentioned it on your Facebook page or something. There was a picture of you. Yeah, where you look kind of ghastly and you have your throat my slit. Throat's, you're yeah. smiling. I think you're like hamming it up for the picture. But yeah. you were talking. To, um, you're speaking about something where there was this uh, special effects ending where all of the all of the, the kids in the, the ward that had died have like come back to Jennifer Rubin's character one last time. I don't know if it was a, I don't know much about it. I was going to ask you to maybe explain the alternate scene. Cause I didn't, besides that picture, I know nothing about it. Yeah. That's, I don't, you know, I don't really remember. Um, I think, yeah, it was either she was having a dream of mm -hmm. it or, I mean, it was all sort of dreamy. So yeah, she was transported back to the cult house and we were all there or something. And, and I, yeah, I think it was, oh, that was it. Yeah. Cause it was slit. And so I smile at her and then I do that and you can see my throat slit and there's all this blood. So I think it was a, supposed to be a scary scene or something like that. I, that's as, that's as much as I remember. I didn't, I didn't know if it's something you would remember or not. I know it was a long mm -hmm. time ago, but yeah, it was dreamy. That's what you would mm -hmm. expect from a movie called bad dreams. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, as I, as I as I go like I said as I go through your work, you had a bunch of stuff that happened in 1990. So um, may I assume correctly that the next movie was Rockula, your first lead role? It was, yeah. Okay. Um, once again, I think a lot of people when they ask you about it, they're very you know jokey about it. I wanted to ask you about the movie itself because there were some things that I recently learned about this film. Like when I first saw it when I was much younger, I actually did see this in the theater, Dean. We had in wow. a small we had in a small theater. My sister took me. We saw the commercial for it in one of our local affiliates. It was a Cinema One Forty One. This we, they used to just throw all kinds of random weird movies, lesser yeah. seen movies there. Rockula was there, right? And I'm like, ah, once again, let's go see oh. that. Steve Cameron, let's go. Yeah, let's go see that. It looks cool. And yeah, I didn't. You know, I was younger. I didn't know what to think of it. Saw it again. You know, and I got a little bit older on cable and thought like. Oh, this was uh this is a this is a well kind of, you know it's weird you know it's, it's uh you know it was definitely made for its time yeah and enjoyed it yeah. and I'll even say this I just watched it again and I've, I've seen it since then but 
I watched it again this week. Uh, Shout Factory had it. I, I was going to pre-order uh, Summer School on Blu-ray. They're releasing a, a new version right. of that, or, or for the first time on Blu-ray. Right. Um, and then I saw like they'll have these like those little strips of categories, and this is one that they were running low on inventory, and it's going to go out of print soon. And Rockula was there, oh, and cool. I'm like, I don't have Rockula. I better I better buy this now. So I bought it. I knew you and I were going to talk. I, I I wound up watching it. I had no idea that you wrote. The, the, I didn't no idea you were um, a musician. That you wrote songs. Yeah. That you wrote some of the songs from the director. But please tell me more about. I mean, you worked with Thomas Dolby. Thomas Dolby was just you know an amazing musician. Oh um, yeah, he blinded me with uh, she blinded right. me with science. Right. Too. Thomas Dolby was one of the first people to start trying to develop a file format for music on the internet. And he was a, he spearheaded that in the, the early nineties, it was like before MP3s, he was trying to get this file format. Uh, really smart guy. You know, he played with Pink Floyd and like Def Leppard and all sorts of people in addition to being an amazing solo artist. Uh, yeah. And wildly hilarious in the movie too. Oh, I mean, he makes every time I watch that movie, just the way he talks, his facial yeah. expression. I'm like, great. I wish he was in more stuff. He was great. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what songs did you write for the, um, they didn't go into too much detail. They just said, oh yeah, Dean was a musician. He could play guitar. He, could, he wrote some of the songs. And I'm like, right. oh, I need to know more about this. Right. Uh, I wrote, uh, well, I wrote the, the Rapula, which I just based, uh, just sort of told the story of, of the, novel dracula in 80s rap white guy rap like that uh yep. the, the last song the king is back i wrote and i played guitar on that that's it those two songs uh, yeah. more songs than i've written dean in my life that, that's very <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's like man it was very you know, dream, that, and that movie was a you know a, a big dream come true which was to you know carry a movie, be number one on the call sheet in a movie. And, and, and I also got to sing and play guitar and that was going to kiss a girl on screen and all sorts of fun stuff. So it was, it was a big check, check mark, check box uh, for me. It was nice. Yeah. And oh, worked with amazing good. people, you know, Bo Diddley, uh, Thomas Dolby, Tony Basil, just great legends. So, uh, and, uh, Oh, Oh, I forgot Susan Susan Tyrell, mm -hmm. who was crazy good. So it was a it was a really nice experience. Unf unfortunately, um, it didn't. I guess it came out in one theater. I guess you're the theater that it came out in, and I, I think it also played in my hometown, like through no, it was uh, sort of random. It played in Norman, Oklahoma, I think, for a week. Um, yeah, it can because the studio was went bankrupt and oh yeah canon canon yeah. that's right um so wait so so dean you were saying that they didn't play that in your hometown because they knew that you were in it and it was your hometown it was just a random thing no they did it, it was released in yeah my hometown right okay but was it was was it done purposely because they knew you lived there or is it just no just ha just happened to show up in norman because one of the things that back then that studios the people who made movies would do is you would get more money for your movie if you guarantee that it was going to for video for home video release if it had played in a movie theater so they would it's called four walling where they would just rent a theater and play it for a week and then they could tell they could you know contractually say yeah it played in a movie theater so that's what happened with rockula and and ski school too as well uh, they just put it in theater so they could say yeah it's in a theater give us that extra hundred thousand dollars or whatever they got for video distribution. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know that about, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. So, um, you bringing up ski school, that's the, um, you know, that's, that's the next, that was the next project, right? Ski school. No, I did, uh, uh, did men at work after that. Okay. After, after Rockula men at work. And then, uh, yeah, and then ski school and then outer space. And awesome. Well, I was going to ask you about Men at Work because, once mm -hmm. again, this is another movie that people – I mean, I, I love it. A lot of my friends love it. 
um, I remember the first time I saw it, you know, it's, it's when Emilio and, and Charlie Sheen were like red hot. Yeah. Um, it just come out on cable. Keith David's in it. And yeah. I liked him from uh, They Live. About, yeah. what, 30 minutes in a movie? All of a sudden, you show up as the pizza delivery guy. And right. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm so <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Great. They just, my only qualm with that is they had you gag too long, Dean. I joked at the time that I was getting paid per line, and my per line quote was very, very high. <laughs> like, I wanted just from, from then on to get paid the same amount for every line I had in a movie or TV show, and then I would make a lot of money. That's great. So, so most of your scenes were with uh, were with Keith David and Emilio, right? Because yeah. I think Charlie Charlie Sheen was with the the lead actress. Mostly Hope, yeah. Yeah, uh, please, please tell me um, any stories with Emilio, Keith, David. I mean, they're two actors I, I really do. I'm a, I'm a fan of as well. I would love to hear anything. Well, um, so Keith, this is my, I love this about Keith, David. So I had seen him do a, a Shakespeare play called Coriolanus, Cor Coriolanus at the Public Theater in New York with Christopher Walken playing the lead role. A couple years before this, and in, in the performances, Chris Walken wouldn't look any of the male actors in the eye. He would not make eye contact with them. He would only make eye contact with the, with the females in the show. And I thought that was really cool. And Keith David was in it. Andre Brauer was in it as well. It was great. So about a weekend, you know, you get to know someone. And so finally I said, hey, Keith, you know, I saw, uh, I saw you in uh, Coriolanus at the public. He's like, oh, cool, cool. I said, I, I thought that was really cool how, uh, how Chris Walken wouldn't look any of the male actors in the eye. And Keith David goes, you like that? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, yeah, it probably wasn't as fun for you, huh? And he goes, no. So, <laughs> that. And the other thing is um, the NWA record had come out. And like every young white actor, I had it. And I knew all the lyrics. And so did Emilio. And so Amelia and I would, would bust out NWA lyrics and uh, Keith David, who's this, you know, classically trained Shakespearean guy from New York. It's like, what are you guys doing? What do you, what is this rap thing you're doing? It's like, we're like, oh, it's NWA. And I, I, I think I gave Keith an NWA tape. So that's cool. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you were, yes, yeah, so you were a fan of NWA, not, not to, not to shoot forward too much, but then you, you also yeah. popped up in uh, Straight Outta Compton, exactly. so uh, which Pretty which cool. surprised the hell out of me. Surprised um, the hell out of me too, because <laughs> I, I got the call the night before that the shoot, like literally like seven o'clock at night. So like, oh, you booked the NWA thing, so go. They're gonna call you, so go do that tomorrow. I'm like, okay, cool. Right, right. Yeah, yeah that's um. Th that was I was on a trip to uh, a business trip to Utah. And it was still when uh, they were showing movies on there that were still kind of in the theater at the time, right. like on their tail end. Heard it, heard all these great things about Straight Outta Compton. I'm watching it on the plane. Your scene comes up, and I just, you know, I'm kind of because I got my headphones in, so I'm in my own world. I just kind of say out loud, "Man, that's Dean fucking Cameron." Holy <laughs> shit! And the guy next to me is like, "What?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, my bad." <laughs> <laughs> nice. So men at work, yeah. The uh, any any uh, let me see. just uh, Amelia and Charlie were super nice. That it was just a great time. The the weird thing about that movie was I shot for I think six weeks. It was a long time, mm -hmm. um, and it was all night shoots. And when you do night shoots, you know you sleep during the day and then you go to work at night, and uh, it's very alienating because you know you don't have your friends that are all awake when you're asleep and you're asleep when they're awake and so for a, a long time it's, it sort of messes with your brain fine problem to have but uh I, that's one of my big memories from that is just like, driving home when everyone else was going to work and sleeping all day and then going going back to work it was weird it was fun it was a great time and the, the other guys tommy hinckley and john john putch and Cameron Dye and, and Jeff Blake, just all these guys I'd known forever, and we all got to work on this movie. It was really fun. Yeah. And Martin I, Sheen showed up one day and uh, did an impression of Emilio. They shot him 
doing like some lines that Emilio is doing. He's sort of making fun of Emilio. It's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's great. Yeah, not for some reason I don't know why not many people talk too much about that film um, or have even asked you about it. But I thought like. Man, he got to work with all these people, and then it's a it's a hilarious movie. I tell everybody that hasn't seen it to, to please, you know, go check it out. And, and oh, Keith you know David what, too. I, you know what I have? Hang on. Oh yeah. It's on my hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. That is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's so great. Holding up after all these years too. Yeah. yeah. I was I always wondered what actors would take away. Like if there's um like um I think Stuart told me with they came from outer space, you guys wound up buying the the wardrobe towards the second part of the season because you yes. guys those were like style and threads, man. I mean yeah, so okay. I was always wondering like if actors keep stuff or if they just are like, oh, I'm I I'm tired of this, like get rid of it, like I don't want to see it anymore. Oh with yeah. the clothes from your movies and stuff? Well, yeah. Yeah. Those those went out of style. So, <laughs> <laughs> hang on, Dean. Everything comes back in style. So mm. pretty soon, you never. <laughs> mm. about those clothes. <laughs> no. So from uh, from men at work, then you you went into ski school, which right. uh, I, did. I had yeah. no idea till Stuart told me that you had you you guys wrote all the funny jokes. I mean, you guys are what made that movie. For like main reasons I liked it, the, the the comedy bits and all that. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to take credit for everything that was funny in the movie. The, the script, the, the certain baseline script was very funny. There was some really funny stuff, which is one of the reasons uh, I wanted to do ski school because there was it, specifically there was the, the monologue about shaving the marmot that I thought was really weird and subversive and wasn't happening in movies at the time. So that was cool. Uh, but yeah, we, we, they, at one point they realized that Patrick and Stuart and I had something cool going on and asked us for some ideas for scenes. And we went and wrote the scene, you know, sort of brainstormed these scene ideas. They transcribed them, wrote them down, and then we shot them. <laughs> and then um, I, I think he told you this. And so then when they came back, they, wrote another script and dropped all these scenes in to somehow make them make sense. And when we did some reshoots as well to sort of try to make a story out of a movie called ski school. <laughs> yeah. Ski school. Not a lot, not a lot of teaching how to, how to ski either. Um, well, it said it's not about learning to ski. I think that was on the poster or something. So. One, one giant party. Yeah. Yeah. I remember seeing that movie and I'm like, man, one day I'm going to, I'm going to ski in a party like Dave Marshak. I <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> got on skis a couple of times. It did not work out well. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was one of the funny things is, you know, Pat Laberto, they never asked him if he could ski. Hmm? And so got up on the mountain and, and they're like, okay, ski down there. He's like, I, I can't ski. What are you talking about? <laughs> And so the end of that day, the director actually carried Pat on his back down the slope, down the hill, because Pat, Pat couldn't ski. I don't think Stuart could ski either. So yeah, I, I think they never they, asked. They, they, yeah. They just, they just assumed and it's like, Oh, I don't, I don't know how to ski. So yeah, not yeah. even doing the bunny slope. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, I ad nauseum, you've, you've been asked about ski school. Um, any, but I'll, I'll say anything. Was there any, the, the writing thing really, you know, impressed me. I, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that about you, Dean, that you and, you and Stuart, um, I, I, I think this is my kind of lead into my, to they came from outer space, uh, that you guys, you know, formed a, a, a friendship then, and then you, you wrote together and collaborated well. And then that, that kind of carried over to that series. But before I jump into they came from outer space, is there anything funny from ski school, just anything random that you remember? The most about it that you'd want to share because yeah the um one of my favorite memories from ski school is the uh director of photography was setting up a shot he's looking through the lens and we we're up on the mountain it was cold and, and it was sort of snowing and the director 
uh, started peeing on the DP's leg. They were old friends and just peeing on him and looking at us like, ah, ah, being on, being on Curtis's leg, and Curtis, the DP did, had no idea what was going on. And <clears throat> I was, you know, very well aware that we were doing a movie called ski school. And I looked around, I think Patrick was there and I said, you know, this is the same equipment, you know, 35 millimeter camera and these lights that they use on the Godfather, but we're making ski school. So, <laughs> but I don't think, I don't think uh, Coppola, you know, peed on Vittorio Storaro's leg at any, at any time during no. the shooting of Godfather. No, no, that's, that's a safe to bet to assume that Dean. I think you're right. I don't yeah. think there was any urinating on <laughs> Don't be making that. But still, that's what makes ski school, ski school, and makes it so unique. Yeah, that's that is hilarious. That's yeah. hilarious, Dean. Wow. So, so the next, the they came from outer space, which I, I mean, you probably know at this point. I absolutely love this show. Um, it's yeah, it was so that's, cool to see your uh, someone sent us your your review or recap of it, and it was uh, very very charming because no one's ever you know, something Stuart and I are very proud of, and uh, it sort of just fell away and went into the ether and it was nice that someone appreciated it. I mean, I know a lot of people appreciate it, but can publicly came out and appreciated the show. And so that was, that was neat. So thanks. I recently, I couldn't find it. The DVD was out of print. I wound up having to go third party, paid a lot for it, but uh, glad I own it. And I thought I'm going to do a review. No one's heard of the show. No one's going to see it. Um, I asked if there's, there's little, there's little to no information about this show online. Um, yeah. I was like, you know what, I'm gonna do, I just wanna do this review. I never thought maybe the stars would see it. I, I said, if anybody's worked on the show, I was thinking like a script supervisor or a PA or somebody, let me know. And the fact that you and Stuart both saw it and enjoyed it, oh, that was a big highlight, big highlight okay. for me last year. I, I super appreciate that you appreciated it, Dean. Oh, sure. Hey, I love when people like me, so that's <laughs> So yeah, Stewart told me a lot about the show. He right. he remembered you know he remembered a lot of things. Some of my assumptions that you guys improvised a lot were correct. Yeah, I don't even. I mean, I'm 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 just a fan. I'm just a guy. But I'm just thinking that show to me. I don't know if that would have worked without anybody besides both of you together doing your thing. Because I that's that's what to me makes the show. And the, um you know. Your jokes, your running gags that you had, the physical comedy. You worked with so many great guest stars. Wh who was your favorite guest star working on there? There were so many. Who was your, you can name a few. Like, just Halle Berry. I'm not familiar with her. Who is? <laughs> she was a young actress back then. I don't know what's happened to her. But, uh, yeah, I fell off uh, the face she of was the cool. Earth. Everyone was great. Um, we shot a lot on that show. It was a one hour comedy, which there aren't any for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it was a lower budget show and we we're trying to make this new network. So the shooting schedule was super tight. We do 10 to 11 pages a day, which at, the, at that time was crazy because you're shooting with film cameras and reloading and lights and turning around and setups and stuff. Not like today where, you know, usually people shooting with two or three cameras now on, you know, one hour, one hour shows mm -hmm. at the time it was one camera. Sometimes they'd have two if there were stunts or something. But so Stuart and I were head down trying to do this. So the guest stars would come in and really, if unless someone was a jerk, we really didn't get to spend time with them or, or, or acknowledge that they were there. It was just, Oh, this is another person. We're working with this person and we're going on and do another scene and stuff. Um, I remember Ron Masak was really nice and really cool. And a couple people like him said, I'm doing the show because my kids love the show and they really wanted me to do the show. Like, because they had offered it to Ron and he had been on, uh, in everything. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was really a blur and it was hard. It was, I mean, it's TV, so it's not that hard in the real world, but for what we were doing, it was long hours and, and uh, exhausting. And I remember at one point, 
we we just couldn't remember any lines. It was maybe like 15 weeks into the shoot, like our brains were full and we, we then sort of cut out the paragraph, the, our lines and, and I put them on, like taped them to Stuart's head for my close up and he put them all over me for his close up. And, and for our two shot, we had him put on the car and, and felt horrible because we were cheating. Uh, but we just, our brains had filled up with dialogue and uh, couldn't remember anymore. So that was, <laughs> that was, that was the one thing. And then there was another time. I remember when, when we got the, when we first got the gig, I said to Stuart, there's going to be a day where we're in that car for like three or four months and it's winter and it's going to be raining and snowing and or raining and freezing and we're going to be super bummed. So let's remember this this day when we when we booked the gig. And sure enough, there's the episode with the dog, with the talking dog. Yep. Or, yeah. Yep. yep. So we're it was freezing cold and raining, and I think Stuart was sick. And we're just like, and I, and I and I went, oh hey, remember when we booked the gig? And I said this was going to happen. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, right. And it cheered us up for a little bit. So stuff like that. I wanted to ask you this, maybe maybe had a little bit more insight on that. Speaking of that episode, there's that episode, and there's another couple episode uh, where there's a Friday the Thirteenth joke or a Jason Voorhees reference or somebody right. on there. So. I um I, f I didn't find this out till much you know till I I got the uh, the DVD set that Tommy McLaughlin was a creator for this and I'm yeah. I, I, Friday the Thirteenth Part Six is genuinely my favorite Friday the Thirteenth oh, movie. Wow. So when I saw all that stuff in there, I thought, wow, I wonder how much um you know because I don't once again I don't think anybody ever everybody always talks to him about Friday the Thirteenth Part Six. They don't ask him anything you know nothing else that he's done. He's done a lot of good stuff. Yeah. But they never asked him about this show. What kind of um, involvement, uh, Dean, did he have on this I on the show? Think, I think, and I'm not sure, and you might have to ask him or contact him. I, I think he was sort of pushed out of the, the proceedings after oh. the pilot. Yeah, um, because he really wasn't around. And I don't know if I, I don't know if he had other projects that he was doing or it was some political move, but uh, and we're friends on Facebook and we have mutual friends, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that something, something weird happened and I'm not sure what. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just, like I say, his name always popped up. I mean, when I, you know, I saw the credits, my, I was like, wait, is that the same, uh, same Tommy McLaughlin? I'm yeah. like, Oh wow. Okay. Well, probably another reason I like this show. I see a yeah. lot of people I like are involved in it. So I, I just wanted, yeah, I just wanted to ask because I don't, you know, there's, there's really not a lot of information about it. Yeah. There was one thing, and I, I don't, I don't know if I didn't watch the whole thing with Stuart that he did, but there was one thing that didn't make it. There was this thing it's called Maggie balls, I think Meg, Maggie balls or Maggie balls. So if when we would get scared, we'd basically shit out of our mouths, <laughs> and these 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 balls of, I guess it was sort of like falafel type things would come out of our mouths when we were scared that we never shot that but it was in the it was in the pilot script I remember oh, we, like that would happen but that never really went anywhere thankfully uh, <laughs> according to story you, you guys didn't know that it was going to be a, like when you did the final episode it was going to be a wrap and that you had actually written a script <laughs> for the next season that actually I actually read it's on his site I thought that was oh right cool. And I'm not wow. just, and I'm not just saying this because you're my guest, Dean. I was laughing. It was, I mean, it felt like you know. Sometimes you like you'll read like a, I'll see like a spec script that somebody wrote, and it doesn't feel like mm -hmm. uh, this felt like this would go right into the show. You, you know, the mom, the mom and uh, dad came back. Right. There's actually an interaction with them. The military came back. Did the energy transference again. So for a fan like me, I thought, ah, oh, just I'm glad that at least I have something like that, and it's rubber stamped. I mean, you and you and Stuart wrote it, so it's. Right. And the whole time I'm thinking, how much would they have ad libbed? This is funny, but imagine what they would have done ad libbing, getting making it, you know, taking it up to the umpteenth level. So right. they want to give you credit for that. That's that's well, on his thanks. website. Though. It was hilarious. Thanks. I haven't. I I need. I haven't read it since we wrote it, so I should. I should take a look at that. Yeah. I think it's called, uh, we called it, Oh No, They Wrote One, I think. Yes. Yeah. Like it's written by both of you, but then I think it was like directed by 
either you or Stuart and, and Alan Smithy. So I thought that was yeah, I like, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I put I think I put directed by Dean Cameron because I I wanted to do that when we made deals for the following season. Uh, yeah, I was going to direct it at least one episode. It was cool. But never happened, yeah. unfortunately. That would that would have been great. Yeah. Um, I do, I do like the uh, the season the the two part season finale. Yeah, was you know, you actually had bad aliens come right. to Earth, and that's what I was maybe hoping. Like I wondered if maybe that's what was planned for the next season. There was going to be more baddies because to me, you guys weren't really the underdogs. You had powers. You were always able to figure something out. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the. I think problems with the show is that th there was really no threat to us and we could always get out of anything. And which was sort of the charm of the show is you knew that everything was going to be fine. So like Gilligan's Island, they weren't going to starve or die. It's just, you had a fun time watching them. Uh, right. Right. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that would have been neat if there were those, those aliens from whatever that planet was, uh, were around. Be cool. Yeah, yeah. It's and like I say, it's it's a it's a it's a sin. It's, a, it's so sad that I can't just point people where to go watch it because it's um yeah that's so phenomenal and and you can't even buy it. You know right? It, yeah, it had been bootlegged on on YouTube for a long time, but I guess someone took it off. Stuart also told me that he has so much, so many, so so much footage and things that could be used for extras if there was ever a new release for it. Hmm. Um, I, I try to bring it up any, anywhere, everywhere I can just to make enough buzz about it to maybe shout or somebody else would do something like that, do a re-release on Blu-ray and, um, make this available and, and even include some of these extras that are already, you know, he already has. It's not, it's right. nothing we'd have to reshoot or anything. I mean, it's, it's there. Yeah. So, um, I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's come and gone and it was of its time and good memories. Good times. Here's one of my like, things I, I like that one of my fun stories about that show is I had this roommate, Court McCowan, who's now a really successful stand up comic. Uh, and so he was at the time a broke, destitute actor living in this bedroom of my house, renting out a bedroom in this house that I had. And so he would come to lunch every day because it was free. And, and good and they like, you know, they catered lunch and it was always really good. And so <clears throat> at a certain point, the first AD, when, in, when he would call, all right, lunch half hour, he would say, court's lunch half hour, because court would show up every, every day for lunch. And he actually ended up writing it on the call sheet uh, <laughs> that, you know, when lunch was be like, court's lunch, one half hour. It was very <laughs> and I just, I, found, I think I have it. Anyway, I won't bore you with it, but I found the call sheet, one of the call sheets with it, and I sent it to court, and we, we had an, a funny chuckle about that, <laughs> about his, his bad old days. Like, you and Stuart looked like you guys were just having so much fun. Yeah. It was infectious, and um, I know. I don't want to talk ad nauseum about the show, but that's, big that's fan. Why we're, really that's why, 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 why we're you and I are here, because you love the show. So. Yeah. I, yeah. I do remember this about Halle Berry. Yeah. Is that she was from Chicago and we shot that episode and we took a break for the holiday for Christmas and she missed her flight coming back or, and so they had to shuffle around it and sort of like, really, who's this girl or actress that they're moving the schedule around for? Who does she think she is? Some sort of star or something? Cause it was, I think it was one of her first jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, that's Halle Berry. Very cool. Yeah. I joked with, I joked with Stuart. I said, I was very disappointed when she got her, um, when she got her Academy Award, she didn't mention they came from outer space in her acceptance speech. I think that was a miss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when that unfortunately wrapped too soon, the next film uh, I wanted to talk to you about was Miracle Beach. That was recently re-released. I had, I had not seen that in some time. Uh, you know, you got to work with uh, Pat Morita. Yeah. You got to work with um, Amy Dolenz, mm -hmm. dressed like a genie the whole time. Um, yeah. Sure, you were roughing it, Dean. Uh, yeah. No, once again, no one really talks to you about something like this. But I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what you felt about the project. Just 
Uh, it's one of the things I'm not thrilled with, and I don't really talk much about it. It was uh, I, I was having a hard time, and and sort of not sort of I at that point I realized the writing was on the wall for my career, and it was over. And um, so it was it was a uh, I I did not have a fun time on that movie, and that's it. Okay, got yeah. you. But it was I mean, but not not for anyone else's fault, but my own. So Amy Dolan's is amazing, Pat Morita, and also Vincent Schiavelli and Martin Mall and uh, Alexis Arquette, who's no longer with us. Yeah. Uh, just uh, great people. Scott McKay, the director was awesome. Just, I was, I was in a bad headspace at the time and just, anyway, so. Sure. Less sure. Said about, I call it miserable beach, so. Yeah, uh, I, I saw you mention. Yeah, I, I saw something like that on your website or something. You had some screenshots. Yeah. I think you called it like, yeah, miserable beach or miserable, whatever. But, miserable beach, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, um, well, yeah, I, the only reason I brought it up, I, because, you know, Amy Dolan's is, is beautiful and, beautiful. you know, you got to work with her. So that was something I wanted to ask about any, any interactions with you, but you've, you've already yeah. kind of addressed yeah. that. So she was great. It was, I mean, everyone was great. It was, I was not great. So it was. Here's another thing I can't find a lot of information on too is um, Ski School 2. Like one day I just went into Blockbuster and Ski School 2 is there and I'm like, oh, okay. And I, you're on the front of it. And, you know, they, they didn't have the old, the old the whole gang with you. It was just you, uh, different type of story. I, yeah. I still think it's funny, Dean. I, I, I don't hate it, but I guess I don't know anything about any of the story at all, why the, the old gang wasn't there. Or that, I think that was purely financial. Yeah, I think. Everyone except me didn't make very much money on that movie. Um, so, and I, what I, the, my favorite thing about Ski School 2 was that Movie Line Magazine called it the most unnecessary sequel ever made. So I thought that was cool. <laughs> uh, but I, I, Will Sasso, who's great, is in it um, and doing great. And Bill Dwyer, uh, great stand up comic. Still working, still doing great stuff. Um, I'm still friends with him. Uh, I had a, f a fun time. It was I. I realized while I was up. I mean, it was it was at the end of my tenure uh, as a viable leading man in Hollywood. And I was like, yeah, okay, this is it. This is my last one, and I'm gonna have a fun time. And I had a, I had a really fun time doing that, and uh, a great experience. Paid my rent for a couple of years. Um, allowed me to sort of go broke slowly. Um, so it was it was a good time. And then I yeah, and then I did some other other independent films, which were really fun and, and good. But you know, didn't make any money. Didn't do very well. So yeah, it was um, I'm trying to think. Uh, is it uh, the Sleep with Me and then the Hollywood Palms that you wrote with with uh, Patrick Laberto? Yeah, I did Sleep with Me and then I did um, two movies, two of Noah Baumbach's early movies. One was called Kicking and Screaming, and the other one was called High Ball. And then I did another movie called High Life, which was one of the writers from Sleep with Me it was his writing and directorial debut in New York. Yeah, and that was about it. That was it. That was the end of that era. Um, yeah. So, but fine. I mean, that, that happens. But those are I'm really proud of those parts and my performances in them too. I'm really happy with. I think it's after Sleep with Me. Oh no, I did Sleep with Me, and then I did Ski School. Right, because we went to the I went to the Cannes Film Festival because Sleep with Me was uh, in the competition there. And I remember I flew back from France and then went directly from France, landed in LA and then went right up to Canada to do Ski School 2. So yeah, it was still Sleep With Me and then Ski School 2. And then things started to fade. And um, and yeah after, yeah, after Ski School 2, everything sort of went south and I ended up working as a magician in uh, Las Vegas uh, for a while and kicking around and but yeah but Pat Laberto and I had written this script and and it kept getting 
kept getting financed and then losing the money and getting financed, losing the money, which happens with scripts for about three or four years. And then finally in 2000, it got made. But at that point I had started working as a programmer uh, for this for web stuff. So I and had basically retired and uh, worked on Hollywood Palms, which was an amazing experience. Just great, great time. But that was the one where I was like, after this movie is done, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm going to work supporting myself. And I, this girlfriend who's now my wife. Um, so yeah, so that, that was, that was that. But yeah, Hollywood, Palms was, Hollywood Palms was a blast and just a dream come true. Another, you know, check that box, like something you made, something you wrote gets made, which is impossible. And it was really cool to do. Right. Yeah, I saw that on cable um, so many years ago. I had no idea that you, you, you know, it was one of those ones you just, I watched late at night. Um, I, I had no idea that you, you know, you and you and Patrick Labrador had, how Labrador had written that. Mm -hmm. um, it's one I want to go back and watch again now that I know this. Right. Um, so, like I said, I wish I had more questions for you, but it's been, it's been such a long time. It's Don't a little talky, time. you know, it's, a, it's of its time. I think it was made about two years too late. Um, but I'm, pr I'm some of my best work. Um, I think it, yeah, it's a fine movie from, you know, 2000. It's proud of it. You did bring up, you were a magician in Vegas. Yeah. I heard you bring this up on another interview before and the person just went and I'm like, whoa, wait, wait, I want, this is, Hey, listen, this is actually very cool. I mean, it's, to me, I think that's, it's cool. If I went to, if I went to Vegas and all of a sudden they're like, ladies and gentlemen, Dean Cameron, and you're up there doing magic the highlight of my life i'm like wait 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 you know mad i mean dean okay you you're <laughs> the an highlight of your life and not the highlight of my life which <laughs> happened, happened a lot I just, I just think it's i just think it's cool because like obviously you're an actor you, you write scripts you write scripts for tv you write scripts for movies you write uh you're a musician mm -hmm. you write music you write html you do magic i mean I just think this is incredible. All the talent you have. That's, that's, that's what I meant by that. It's, 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 uh, it was fascinating just to right. hear that. Like, right. Well, the, the, the magic I was doing, I mean, it was a, uh, it was not like my own show. It was part of this thing at Caesar's palace called Caesar's magical empire. And I was a singing wizard for your dinner, uh, during, for dinner, like your host. And so you'd, you'd go down into this pod and, with strangers and and then this wizard would show up and sing and tell jokes and do some magic during your dinner. It was uh, anyway. I literally singing "Try the Veal," you know, so stuff like that. It was it was a uh, humbling, humbling, to do that because I'm you know wearing a purple robe and a crown and. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I got. Yeah. Okay. I. I yeah. I wasn't at the Magic Castle doing amazing mysteries. I was doing, you know, thumb tip stuff. So, but, but, however, I met, I became, well, I had met him years before, but I became really close friends with Penn Jillette, who became, you know, one of my best friends for years and years now. Um, so that was the great that came out of that bad situation was becoming friends with him. And that, that sort of changed my life in a good way. Um, yeah, it's good. Oh wow, that's that's great. Um, and then and you, you've done so. Then you you've, you also though started to, you did voiceover work. Yeah, you wrote you learned HTML, so you became a programmer. I mean, well, I tried learning I HTML and and TCL and PHP and ASP and yeah, all all that stuff. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, worked as a programmer for about eight eight or nine years until I realized I was horrible at it. And uh, <laughs> and also the, the industry had changed when I started doing it. I, it started it because I was I, this friend of mine asked me to develop, help him develop this web service. Um, and so it was this very exciting time. It was the late nineties and the internet was this new sort of new thing that people were bringing innovation and cool ideas and fun stuff. By the time I stopped programming, it was just another corporate gig. And, and I thought, well, if I'm going to go go to work and be miserable, I might as well try to be an actor again. So I did. <laughs> uh, 
I did, yeah. And and my wife is an editor, and she wanted to. There's her bay back there. Um, oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, uh, she's edits on uh, Law and Order, Organized Crime. Um, oh, that's awesome. From from there, that's in our house. So. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, but so she wanted to really advance her, start really pursuing her career. We had had a son, and and I was missing raising my son, so. I sort of started staying home with him, trying to work again, and she went off and edited. So it was cool, good, good thing. I do appreciate editing. Um, that's 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 kind of how I got started. Um, I, I went to college. I, I became an editor. So that's that's why I was blown away by the bay behind you. Wow. I thought that was. I think that's really cool. Like I legit. I was like, oh. This in those old days of we had to go to a bay where you can just do it. Like I I do editing right from the very computer. I'm talking to you on right now to oh, do wow. stuff. Cool. So. Just, it's crazy. Nothing well, it's amazing because she's actually tunneling into a machine at Universal. So this, it's all remote and proxies and stuff like that. It's crazy. Oh, and then, you know, they shoot in New York and here and uh, kids with their TV and their stuff. It's yeah. Crazy. Yeah, their internets, their interwebs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm a, I'm a big fan of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You know, I'm, I'm right outside Philly. To my surprise, when they did this the the 80s, 90s throwback episode with the with skiing, and yeah. you were on there, theme, please. I would I'd love to know anything and anything you wanted, anything and everything you wanted to share about that because uh, working with that cast and everything because it's one of my top three favorite episodes. Oh, cool. Well, I'm a huge fan of that show. I, I'm, those guys are geniuses. And to the level that they've sustained over the uh, decades now um, is astonishing how good that show is. And, you know, um, Psych, I did an episode of Psych that was written for me. And the ski, this ski episode for Always Sunny was written for me and just completely flattering. And I was worried a little bit that they were maybe making fun of me uh, me personally, and they weren't, I think, I think it was more about the genre and the time and the, the movies, but man, I just had the best time with those guys and they were super nice. I mean, the, I, we shot up in Mammoth Mountain, which is a big ski place here. And the first night I was there, I went to the restaurant to go get some food and they were all sitting there, Danny DeVito and Charlie and all, all of them were sitting there like, Hey, come over, have, have dinner with us. And so I sat and with them for like two hours and shot the shit and had nicest guys in the world. It was great. And just had a great time. The daunting thing about it though, is they're, you know, they're all writers and producers on the show. So I'd be doing a close up, and they start shouting out, like, try this, say this, do this. They're all directing. I'm like, Oh, okay. All right. And just sort of going with it. That was a little intimidating because they're so fast and funny and good. Um, just trying to keep up with their level. So it was nice. It was a great experience, and I, yeah, just a great time. That's 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 good to hear. I've always wondered about those, you know, how those guys are off camera. So that's 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 really good to hear some positive positive yeah. things. And they're you know they're it's funny because you know and this happens. I think it's true of everyone. They're so serious about their comedy. It's funny that like they have this real uh, idea about things. And you see that in the show, the a, a worldview, and uh, it's not preachy or anything, but this this style because there's no one, there's no other show like that. You know, they this 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 line of being offensive and it's really great, and and that's those guys, and they're they just have that down, and really astonishing. I was a little jealous of it, but uh, man, it was great. And yeah. I think the episode's great. And people say, how about, how, you should do a, ski, a sequel to Ski School. Go, there is one. It's Ski School 3 is Always Sunny in Philadelphia. They did it perfectly. There's no reason to do another another movie. I like, uh, one of my favorite episodes is uh, when they're on the plane trying to beat the Boggs drinking record. <laughs> of beers. That one. And then the one where the gang breaks D, where they, <laughs> yeah, those are those are great episodes. It's a great yeah. show. Yeah, have you have you been watching this season? I have not. I've not. not okay. Yet. Yeah. I I've, I found I have no attention span anymore. So. 
even a half hour of always sunny is, is too much. Dean, I, I just I just had a few more questions I wanted to ask you about. Um, so, you know, everybody will say they know you from from summer school, from ski school. I wanted to ask you, what's what was your besides those two aside, those two characters? What was your favorite character that you played besides Chainsaw? Like, what was your favorite role? Well, Hollywood Palms, that was a big favorite of mine. Um, Chainsaw was great. I mean, it was that was so well written. Uh, most of that was the script. I was just doing the lines that were written in the script. It it was a great script, and uh, I remember reading reading that and thinking, Jesus, this is really funny, and uh, and it was so that and and um, and Rockula, Ralph in Rockula, and and also Ralph in uh, Bad Dreams. It was those those are really. Think a good performances of mine. Yeah, no, oh, that's great. So, so you, you like it's, it's like I said, most everybody knows. You know, you you did you've done the acting. You're the actor, and then I'm finding out more about your writing. Um, what what do you like doing more? Do you like did you like acting or did you like writing? Like which one which one did you like the most? Um, well, uh, my writing success has been limited I haven't done a lot of it i mean i've written a lot but haven't sold a lot um and i as far i i would i mean i would love to be in a writer's room writing on a tv show and sitting around with a bunch of people cracking wise and churning out a, a tv show every week i think that ship has sailed for me i don't think that that's going to happen but uh they're different they're different parts of uh the brain so they're i i love acting i love being on a set and doing working that's really fun um but yeah i i, I love directing i've directed some short films and man that is just a blast to do because it's you have no time to think and um it's really fun to do that so i would like to do more of that again who knows uh but they're all they're all sort of different different parts of, of who I am. So I, I like playing music in front of people, like writing music and playing and trying to get good at that and better at that. It just, you know, I'm lucky that I can do these things. Uh, very fortunate. So yeah, you do the, uh, the, the karaoke, the live, uh, yeah. That's still that's still a thing, correct? Um, yeah, it is. I I I pulled back from it, and now I'll just sub. I'll substitute when when the bass player is busy touring or something. Um, but yeah, that was fun, and you know, playing two three hours a night, three nights a week, just makes you a great player. Or I don't know if I'm a great player, but it really got my playing really good. So. Um, and you know, if any musician asks me for advice, as they get in a cover band and play three or four nights a week for a couple hours, your playing will just has to improve. Yeah, and you get a facility with your instrument that really great. So. Right. Yeah. Um, no, I, I I just think that's I don't think any I've never heard of this before. So if there's somebody else did it before you guys, I don't know, but a live band court um karaoke. karaoke i think that's freaking yeah i think people have done that before um and there it's now it's a big thing there are a lot of live band karaoke's live karaoke bands but i think we we're one of the first and you know our our conceit initially was that we were the Corys from the 80s and because we just played 80s songs um but then we branched out and yeah anyway Gotcha. So is it like what, like uh, like Corey Hart, Corey Haim, Corey Feldman? Yeah. So this, 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 this. We got a, a a call from an attorney at one point, and so then it was Corey Feldstein, Corey Ham, and we kept Corey Hart because no one cares about him. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you are you a fan of uh, uh, Corey uh, Corey Feldman, the, the Corys? The their early stuff they did was amazing. They were they were great. They were really. They were something else. I, mean, I remember seeing Feldman in, in that Friday the 13th, and just, like this kid is amazing. And then Corey Haim and Lucas was, was just heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Yes. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. he's um he's phenomenal yeah. as a musician have you um have you heard any of um Corey feldman's music yes just wanted to know <laughs> you know i i actually one of my uh oh I turned down Rock and Roll High School Forever, which he was in. And uh, okay. apparently I would have had some great stories. So there's just wow. enough said. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I, I know the girl, who, the woman who played the his love, is, love interest in that. And uh, yeah, enough said. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Keep it to my imagination. I'm making. Yeah, it. exactly. I can only. Uh, I actually have a, a friend who's a huge fan of that movie, Rock and Roll High School Forever. Huge fan. Wow. Uh, I was going to be. Uh, uh, there was a guy in the bathroom who ran everything out of the bathroom. That yep. was Yeah. I, I, I was. I just said I can't do another movie with school in the title. I just cannot do it. So. <laughs> yeah. Ser seriously, it was, and you can't change that title of that movie. So. Can't call it like Rock and Roll High School University or something. It takes Rock place at a University high school. So. <laughs> That's a very interesting piece of trivia, yeah. Dean. I, I didn't. I did not know that. That's. Uh, yeah, I didn't talk about that much. Yeah. Let me ask you this: Besides Stuart Fracken and Patrick Laberto, which you're good friends, uh, who's your favorite actor that you ever worked with? Like, who'd you who'd you enjoy? Or you can, you can name a few if you don't want to. I'm just, um, just curious. I mean, Stuart and I had a some sort of magic magicalness that was great grant heslov i did my first series with grant uh called spencer with chad Lowe and, and grant grant and i had a, a really good chemistry too and i loved working with him i mean everyone on summer school was fantastic just great loved working with everyone on that i, I i've been lucky there's i haven't really worked with anyone i have not enjoyed um I think there was one there's one guy I worked with a long time ago that was eh, sort of a pain in the butt, but um I, everybody I've worked with has, has been great. Really great. I got to work with JK Simmons last year. That was awesome. Yeah. Oh on, yeah. Uh, on Goliath. That was really cool. He's amazing. And like there's you know, I I played tennis in high school and, and still do. And some, I don't know if you play a sport or something, but if you play with someone who's really good, really better than you, your game becomes, it just lifts it up. And that's how it was with J.K. Simmons. Like, he's just talking. I was like, oh, I'm just talking to this guy. It was just lovely to do work with him. I mean, yeah, he's awesome. I mean, yeah. everything he's done, Oz, um, yeah. Spider-Man. I mean, I, I can keep going on. He's yeah. amazing. That's That's cool. That's very cool, Dean. Let me just ask you as a personal question. What, you know, because when everyone thinks of Dean Cameron, they'll think of your, your comedies and this, that, and the other. But what, what, are, your, what are your favorite movies, uh, Dean? What, like, what's, what's a couple of your favorite movies? What do you like to watch? Comedy? My two favorite movies are Animal House and Apocalypse Now. There. Good picks. Good yeah. picks, Dean. That's all you need to know about me. Fantastic. Yeah. Love that contrast. Apocalypse yeah. Now. Hearts of Darkness. Yeah. Favorite documentary. It's great. I, I worked with the director of that, of Hearts of Darkness, one of the two directors, George Hickenlooper, in a, the weirdest, uh, it, the, the finest Civil War zombie movie starring Adrian Pazdar and Corbin Burnson ever made. Yeah, it a, it's a, it's, I think it's out. I think it's called Grey. I've never seen it. It's called Grey Knight, I think. Uh -huh. um, and it, the first... The first 30 pages of the script, the leads are not in it. And and so it's all backstory, which is just death to a script. And so it was me, David Arquette, Matt LeBlanc, Billy Bob Thornton, and Josh Evans in this first half hour of the movie, ostensibly. And we were all sitting and going, we're never going to make it in this movie. They're, they're, there's no way they're going to keep us in this. Movie. And sure enough, it cut, cut it out because it's let's let's get to the story and get to the leads of the movie. But it was one of it was the movie that Billy Bob Thornton came up with his character for Sling Blade on. 
he was in his in his he was in his dressing room doing uh, looking in the mirror going ah rah, rah, rah. here's a, my yeah. my funny self deprecating story about Grey Knight and about my headspace at the time. So I'd done Miracle Beach, because the same people that, that did Miracle Beach, and like, do you want to do this movie? George Hickenlooper was directing it and you know, did Hearts of Darkness. Like, yeah, of course. And sort of everybody wanted to do this. So I got this part and we're shooting out and like out in is the summer and we're out in this desert and we had this stupid makeup on, which because we were zombies, Civil War zombies, and in wool uh Civil War suit, like authentic Civil Wars, and it was hot and sweaty. And Matt LeBlanc, this is before Friends, Matt LeBlanc had done a couple of pilots for Fox, the Fox Network, and they did not do well. And and he's great, but in those, I don't think he was, he had not achieved his, his stride at that point. And so I remember sitting on this hill and it's just sweating and there are red ants everywhere and, and just waiting for the sh them to set up a shot. And Matt LeBlanc was over there and I thought, well, my career may be over, but God, at least I'm not Matt LeBlanc because he is done. And then I think the next year he got friends. So <laughs> I was completely wrong. Um, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was, uh, that was gray night for me. If I may ask you one more other question about they came from outer space. Sure. Because I, I, I kind of skipped over this. Stuart didn't know a lot about this, so this is why I wanted to ask you about it as well. <laughs> you have the episode, my favorite episode, is where you own the the, sta the TV station. Yes, that's our, my favorite episode too. Yeah. Oh, is I, yeah. I was going to ask you what your favorite episode is. There we go. The main villain of that episode is like an evil Tony Danza. Right. That theme song is... Well, he don't know science and he don't know art. He's a wacky Italian with a great big heart. Da, 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 da. That's all right, because he's the main. <laughs> Brilliant. That's awesome. You remember the uh, oh, every, yeah. the theme song. Yeah. I was I was just wondering, like, for of all the people in TV land at the time to pick to be the villain, I didn't know if somebody had beef with Tony Danza. Or <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, just, no. I just wanted to know, because I'm like, why? Like, Tony Danza seems pretty awesome. I wonder why someone picked him to be the heel, but uh, I think it was so. The the two writers, Peter Bailoff and uh, I forgot the other guy's name. Th they were the main writers of the show. I think they. It was more about their beef with sitcoms at the time, and just like he, he's the boss was such a stupid show, and there were so many stupid sitcoms at the time. And I think they were just busting on that aesthetic of these guys who were not actors who were somehow became leads of TV series and just that idea. I, I, I don't think they had anything against Tony Danza, but I think they had something against the, that idea of the Tony Danzas of the world who were somehow huge TV stars and, and the horrible, horrible eighties sitcoms that were happening at the time or nineties sitcoms. I love the fact thing that you did. You knew the theme song to wow. "He's a Maid" and you sang that. That's yeah. Wonderful. Well, I know the, the composer Gary Stockdale. Uh, years later, we collaborated on this theater production um, called Bucalcical, which was a fake musical about Charles Bukowski. So, everything you need to know about that was really funny. But Gary and this friend of his had written these like three songs like about like they were a musical about Charles Bukowski. And uh, I was I worked with this theater company at the time and said, we could do this as a show. I can get this. We can do this. I'm going to direct it. And, 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 and uh, it ended up being the conceit of the show was that it was this rotten theater company who were doing a backers audition for their production of Bucalcical and trying to get it, get money for it. And so there was this presentation of these songs and it was really funny, it was really funny. But yeah, so Gary Stockdale, who was the composer for They Came From Outer Space. That's why I know that song. Cause I, I, I would sing it all the time. I, I will sing it, you know, doing work in my garage, like start singing that song. It's hilarious. And um, he also did the theme song, correct? The, yeah. that, came from, that, I, that I absolutely love. He thought from, it was the B-52s, right? I thought it was the B-52s. Yeah. Which, by design, was, it, it was supposed to sound like B-52s, and it did. 
yeah, I, I, I had no idea some spy was like, when I'm, like I said, I, I, that's just something that carried on with me from childhood. I was like, well, the B-52s and I'm, I mean, it sounded so much like it. So yes, you did correct me on that. So thank you. I, my public retraction, <laughs> Mr. Gary, I apologize. I love that song. Trust me. You set me straight. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> Um, I, I just had one more thing, Dean. All right. So I was on an Instagram live video and there was a, a movie that just come out of yours that I had purchased and I couldn't really speak a lot on because it it's one of the ones I haven't seen in a, in a while. It was Miracle Beach, Kino Lorber. Very organically, just out of nowhere, because like, so I was trying to figure something to say. I was like, yes, of, um, of Dean Cameron's catalog, this is probably the film I've seen the least, you know, or as I like to call it, the other DC universe, right? You know, so there's okay. a DC universe and it was, you know, Dean Cameron universe. Well, people got a kind of a chuckle out of it. I started to say this and I was always like, you know, if I ever get a chance to, to, to meet Dean Cameron, I want to ask him about this. I want to think, I want to know if he likes it, if he thinks it's funny and rubber stamp it for me, make it official. Heck he can even run with it if he thinks it's clever enough. But I just wanted to, to do that Dean. Cause I'll keep doing it or, or I'll stop if you don't. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commandeer that from you, actually. Yeah, so thank you. Yes. What a win, Dean Cameron. Consider it stolen, my friend. Yes. <laughs> Take it, run with it. Rubber stamped by, uh, by Dean Cameron himself, so that makes me very happy. I thought it was fun. Wow, that makes perfect sense. The other it's good. It's, it's very clever. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Very, very complimented by that. I appreciate it. Okay. Dean, I can't thank you enough uh, for this. This was uh, this was a joy. Hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah. Um, just really going through your work. I wanted to give you time right now. Is there anything that you wanted to promote? Anything you're going to be in? Your website, ski school cards, anything you're involved with, please. Uh, cameo, anything, please. Floor is yours. Oh, yeah. The ski school cards. Uh, uh, Genius guy, Clinton Keener, last year sent me these trading, a couple trading cards that he was mocking up for ski school. And uh, we ended up, as we're working and giving, giving him quotes, but uh, I have any around here. I don't. But anyway, if you go to deancamera.com and you find ski school cards, buy them. Uh, they're really cool. If, I mean, if you're a fan of ski school at all and you have an extra hundred bucks lying around, uh, they're astonishingly cool and really high quality. And then there's all this other cool stuff that comes with it. There's some, we, we came up with some letters written by Dave Marshak to the new recruits of ski school and a, a letter from Anton Bryce summoning section eight to his office and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's a really cool thing. There's some little stickers and, all of the cards have little quotes on them and, and it, it's neat. So that um, I did, I'm proud of an episode I did of Goliath. I think it's the fourth episode, uh, the new, latest season, fourth episode of the fourth season. That's good. And I'm supposed to be in a couple more episodes, but COVID messed everyone's lives up. I mean, fine. The TV show. Um, but yeah, so that that's good. And I just did a movie and, you know, DeanCamera.com stuff will be up when I get around to it. Time is meaningless, so I rarely do. But uh, yeah. but that, that's it. Oh, yeah. and uh, some kind of joke. I did this uh, Richard Horvitz from Summer School, and he's also in Vader Zim and voiceover guy. We did this thing, 300 episodes every day for uh, one episode every day for 300 days, uh, where we would sort of deconstruct classic jokes on zoom him and i just like there were sometimes they were 30 seconds sometimes they were two minutes long but that's on youtube uh some kind of joke and we had done some other stuff before that so if you want if you have some time go to some kind of joke.com or youtube some kind of joke that's it that's all i got and I will say this too, if I may, Dean. Uh, yeah, definitely check out these ski school cards. I've only seen them on your website. The pictures of them, they look like legit training cards. I mean, these aren't. Go for yeah, please.
they're all sealed, so I, I don't have any. I don't have any that are. It even comes in the little wax paper, like a little, yeah. like the. Oh. Yeah, they've got this sticker on top of them and stuff like that. Yes, yes, you can find that at deancamera.com, Everybody, only a hundred dollars. It's 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 only money. It's only money. It's only Money's free now, so right? So come on. Yeah. Money's free. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and that's cool about um uh, I would like to check this out to some kind of joke with uh, Richard uh, Horowitz. He um he's actually the only new thing they added to uh, some interviews to the, the ski school um summer sorry, school, yeah. summer school right. release coming out. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing what some, some Isn't of the there stuff on the uh, on the Rocky La Blu ray is I did an interview for them. You did. Okay. That's still, did. that still on there? I never saw it. So it's... Yes. Yes. You there's there's one with you, one with the director. Okay. Um and yeah, that's uh you know cool. it's, it's fabulous. It was amazing. You look great, you sounded great, you were awesome. Good. Good. <laughs> um once again, uh deancamera.com. Um thank you so much, Dean. I truly appreciate this. Thank you, all of you, for watching this. Hopefully, you all enjoyed it as much uh, as we did here. Like I always say, anytime you watch a GCAP recap, you always have a seat in my bar. Till next time, my friends.